As you may have guessed if you've seen my video about The Sims series, I really like simulation games. I find that these types of games are usually at their best when they're very mechanically deep. And to my mind, there's no better example of this depth in the sim genre than Dwarf Fortress. The depth and complexity of Dwarf Fortress is interesting not only because of the wacky stories it produces, but also because of the mechanics themselves. A lot of the mechanics in Dwarf Fortress aren't really things you expect to see in a building and community management sim. So many of these types of games, like The Sims or SimCity, are very explicitly capitalist in how they work. But the method of economic and political organization within Dwarf Fortress is especially unusual in that regard, because in practice, it looks suspiciously like anarcho-communism. Now, if you're even casually familiar with Dwarf Fortress, you've probably seen it in its natural state, looking like this. A bunch of letters, numbers, and symbols moving around a window and just being generally incomprehensible. For this video, I'm not going to make you look at it that way. Over the past several years, the community have created numerous visualizers and tile sets that make it much easier for players and non-players alike to wrap their head around what's actually happening in the game. The visualizers I'll be using in this video are the Phoebus 16x tile set, Stone Sense, and Armok Vision. Part 0. The Player and the World. The first thing you do in Dwarf Fortress is generate a world. Every world is different, with an incredible amount of detail. Mountains are generated and then eroded down by rivers. Empires rise through the adventures of heroes and collapse into intricate ruins. Once it's done, you're presented with an extremely large map from which to choose where to place your fort. In addition to being very cool, this also gives the player a sense of their place in the world. This world was not created with you in mind. It's a place that the player is allowed to participate in, but if left to its own devices, it would continue on without their involvement. This stands in contrast to most other games of this type, where the world is either generated or manually constructed with a specific space that it plops the player into. The detailed world which exists outside of what the player will directly experience also still influences and makes appearances in the game in the form of art produced by the dwarves, statues of famous people from hundreds of years in the past, engravings and books telling tales from this world's mythology and history. One thing that frequently confuses new players about Dwarf Fortress is the way that orders are given. Unlike a lot of other games, you can't give specific directions to specific dwarves. They operate under their own will. The player gives general directions to the community at large, dig here, harvest plants there, etc. Then, any dwarf that is capable of doing that labor will do it when they have the time, energy, and the right tools or skills. This might seem like a minor detail, but it's actually fundamentally important to this analysis, because it means that the player's control does not have the ability to override the free will of the dwarves. This becomes especially apparent if something seriously destabilizing happens, like a chain reaction of dwarves having tantrums, or a siege, or a roaming dangerous animal showing up. These crises often cause a complete breakdown of anyone following the player's orders. They have more important, immediate needs. Some other games have similar mechanics for the lowest rung of workers. For example, in Evil Genius, you give a build order or something like that, and the closest available worker takes care of it. The difference, though, is that you still have a higher class of minions who you can give direct orders to. The workers sort of have free will, but they're ultimately able to have their free will overridden by a police class that the player can directly control. In The Sims, even a sim on the verge of death still has to at least acknowledge your orders before dismissing them. This leads us to the question of who or what the player is in Dwarf Fortress. In games like Evil Genius, the player is represented by a physical, literal evil genius that can be seen by and interact directly with the world around them. In SimCity, you're a basically omniscient mayor that doesn't have a physical form within the game. Dwarf Fortress is closer to SimCity in this respect, but with some key differences. Like SimCity, Dwarf Fortress does not have a built-in endgame. The only way to lose is to have all of your dwarves die, making survival the only built-in goal. But unlike SimCity, where a game over can happen if you incur extreme levels of debt and you're forced out of the position of mayor for failing within the capitalist system, Dwarf Fortress only ends if all your dwarves die. This mechanically ties the player directly to the continued survival of the dwarves. In SimCity, a meteor could wipe out your whole city and you could just rebuild and continue as long as you still have money. But that's not possible in Dwarf Fortress. The player in Dwarf Fortress also doesn't have any kind of physical form, as stated earlier. But they do act through the dwarves during situations like trade and negotiations, as shown in a menu pop-up that indicates the player is eavesdropping on the conversation, although as an eavesdropper, you're still able to direct the outcome of the conversation. 
The player can also only see what the dwarves see. If your dwarves haven't noticed an army sneaking up on the fortress, then the player will be none the wiser as well. And the player also has access to the inner thoughts of all the dwarves within the community, to a level of detail that exceeds any other game I'm aware of. So based on all this, the player in Dwarf Fortress can sort of be understood as the collective consciousness and will of the people within the community. The player's goals are effectively aligned with those of the dwarves, since their survival means the continuation of the game and the player's involvement in it. Part 1. Individuality and Needs While the dwarves in Dwarf Fortress might not visually look like all that much, that simple exterior belies a detailed inner world. They have complex emotions based on their recent experiences, beliefs in various deities, preferences and distastes for different animals, minerals, foods, equipment, and even folk songs. They have individual personalities that are affected by, and in turn shape, their lives and the lives of those around them. While a lot of this may seem like just flavor text, most of it does have some in-game effect. You just might not notice those effects unless you know what you're looking for. Preferences for certain items or materials can positively impact the craft dwarfship of certain produced items. Fears of certain situations will cause dwarves to experience more negative emotions when exposed to said situations. Certain skills will be easier or harder for dwarves to use and train, depending on combinations of all those factors. And all of this plays into how the dwarves interact socially. I don't bring this up just because they're really cool little details. All of these details help to humanize the dwarves, to make them more than just mindless cogs in your fortress machine. A lot of this personal detail can be lost in the flurry of activity of organizing a fort, but the fact that at any moment you can zoom in on one of the dwarves and get a detailed description of their mood, their relationships with other dwarves, their beliefs, their personality, and their goals in life serves to ground the player's experience in the individual personhood of the dwarves within this collective society. Although Dwarf Fortress is a game about building a community, it's also very much about the stories and experiences of the individuals that comprise that community. These concepts would be familiar to anarcho-communist writer Peter Kropotkin, who wrote, Looking at society and its political organization from a different standpoint than that of the authoritarian schools, for we start from a free individual to reach a free society, instead of beginning by the state to come down to the individual. We follow the same method in economic questions. We study the needs of individuals, and the means by which they satisfy them, before discussing production, exchange, taxation, government, etc. Your first goal once you've started your fortress is to ensure the survival of your dwarves by producing and gathering ample supplies of food and drink. As long as you're at all familiar with the mechanics of making that food and drink, and you haven't selected a starting point with absolutely no soil, animals, or other natural food resources, then you're not really going to have any trouble creating plenty of sustenance for a highly populated fort. This leaves time for your dwarves to pursue their needs beyond just basic survival. I don't mean just mining, building, and crafting of other items necessary for basic habitation of the fort. Once your fort has basic necessities, there's generally lots of time left over for your dwarves to relax, socialize, and most importantly, to work on luxury crafts. In short, the five or seven hours a day which each will have at their disposal, after having consecrated several hours to the production of necessities, will amply suffice to satisfy all longings for luxury, however varied. Thousands of associations would undertake to supply them. What is now the privilege of an insignificant minority would be accessible to all. Luxury, ceasing to be a foolish and ostentatious display of the bourgeoisie class, would become an artistic pleasure. The creation of luxury crafts is so important because the dwarves have an inherent desire for creativity and craftiness, which, when unfulfilled, will cause the dwarves to become progressively more unhappy. It's the same for us. When we actually have the time and energy to be creative, most of us take up productive hobbies and interests that we engage in to express our inherent desire for creativity and craftiness. Interestingly, this isn't something that's usually modeled in games like these, especially not with the intense level of detail in Dwarf Fortress where the desires and wishes of each dwarf informs what types of crafts they will be most pleased to engage in. Capitalists often argue that individual creativity is impossible under the social forces of communism, which ensure uniformity. But in reality, one of the main goals of anarcho-communism is to ensure that the individual has not only the right to individual creativity, but also the time and energy to engage in that creativity while having their basic needs met. Humans, however, are not a being whose exclusive purpose in life is eating, drinking, and providing a shelter for themselves. 
As soon as their material wants are satisfied, other needs of an artistic character will thrust themselves forward the more ardently. Aims of life vary with each and every individual, and the more society is civilized, the more will individuality be developed, and the more will desires be varied. The creation of luxury items and fortress improvements by the dwarves doesn't only contribute to their own individual happiness. Having your crafts dwarves make pieces of furniture, for example, helps the entire fort because dwarves receive happy thoughts when interacting with, or looking at, high quality pieces of furniture. Having masons smooth and engrave the walls improves your dwarves' happiness by increasing their perceived value of such rooms. And if an engraving is of something a dwarf especially likes or dislikes, then they will in turn consider the room value to be higher or lower, respectively. This becomes an especially important mechanic in communal areas, where having engraved walls, extremely high quality furniture, and plenty to drink allows your dwarves a space in which to socialize and relieve their stress as a community. For example, this dwarf, Oro, is engraving a wall in the fort meeting hall, giving him happy thoughts because he gets to practice a craft and be creative. The engraved wall then increases the happiness of every dwarf that uses the meeting hall, allowing them to relax and de-stress before they return to the work of providing necessary food and drink for the fortress, and therefore for Oro himself as well. This cycle explains the basic idea of communal cooperation, which is crucial to the functioning of an anarcho-communist community. People don't work because they want or need money, they work to help feed, clothe, and enrich the lives of their comrades. Now, some may ask, if everyone has the ability to just sit around and drink in the dining hall, then why do they still work? Essentially, the assumption is that no one will work and the system will collapse without the threat of starvation due to wages being withheld. But if you've been paying attention, the answer here is obvious. In anarcho-communism, starvation is a threat to the community, not just the individual. Therefore, the production of the most basic necessities is a motivator for the community as a whole, rather than it being atomized down to the individual wage slave. This same motivation is also then carried over to the player as the representative of the dwarves' collective will. Survival in Dwarf Fortress isn't just making sure there's enough food, though. Because Dwarf Fortress is a fantasy game, there are enemies and monsters that will attack your fortress. In order to survive, you'll need to form a defensive militia made up of your citizens. These militia members will be pulled away from their normal community-supporting duties during a time of threat, risking their lives to protect their comrades against aggression from monsters and kidnappers. The game doesn't actually force you to create a military, but having some kind of defensive strategy is mandatory for long-term survival. Even then, you still don't need to have some big standing army. Doing so would actually be an impediment to your community, as each soldier is a dwarf removed from the workforce. A dwarf with unique skills and things to contribute to those around them. The only justification for a big standing army would be if you were going to engage in raiding or invading your neighbors, and that's really only necessary if you want to rank up your nobles. But we'll talk about them later. Part 2. Public Policy since population growth in your fortress can be slow, immigration can really help to build your community. Migrants not only bring necessary skills and work power, but they also frequently bring livestock, which, in keeping with the anarcho-communist principle of expropriation, are then brought under community ownership. These new immigrants are not treated any differently by the older community members, and it is in the player's best interest to keep them as well housed and provided for as their comrades. It's also possible to have non-dwarven citizen immigrants by recruiting long-term visitors who are staying at the fort's tavern. These non-dwarven immigrants are treated the same as any dwarf, and participate in the community by providing their labor to the commune in exchange for access to the community's resources. Despite some private property being expropriated by the dwarven community upon immigration, members of the fortress are still allowed to have their own items. Contrary to the common anti-communist complaint that under communism everyone will have to share one toothbrush, most communists delineate a form of personal property that is typically limited to one's own living space, clothes, and other articles that they make very direct and personal use of on a daily basis. This same idea is also present in the mechanics of Dwarf Fortress. The dwarves own their clothes and the few light items which they carry on their persons. They can also be assigned personal rooms where they can keep other belongings and furniture. Outside of these few pieces of property though, everything else within the fortress is entirely communally owned. This includes food, unclaimed clothes, trinkets, and weapons. All the fort's infrastructure is also built, used, and owned by the people. Importantly, this also includes all means of production. Farms, animals, ore and minerals, including precious gems and gold, machinery, tools, and workshops are all community-owned and available for the community to use as needed. 
Because of this communal ownership, there's no opportunity for capitalists to appear. The only things held in private are things that people need to make daily use of. There is a rudimentary division of labor due to specializations, but it doesn't lead to the formation of classes because the division never extends to the means of production and there's no coercion involved. Each individual relies on the production of the community for any needs which they are unable to satisfy through their own labor. Nobody has the right to seize a single one of these machines and say, this is mine. If you want to use it, you must pay me a tax on each of your products, any more than the feudal lord of medieval times had the right to say to the peasant, this hill, this meadow belong to me, and you must pay me a tax on every sheaf of corn you reap, on every rick you build. So what if Dwarf Fortress was capitalist? Would that even work? Well, this might surprise you after all the anarcho-communism talk, but capitalism is, or at least was, a thing in Dwarf Fortress. In some old builds of the game from around 2008, there was a feature called the Dwarven Economy. This feature would enable itself automatically after your fortress reached a certain size, usually after a few in-game years. When this happened, everything in the fortress would effectively become privatized. After this point, dwarves get paid for their work, but they also have to pay rent on their bedrooms and purchase food and other goods from the shops. Everything that was previously communal, from clothes to drinks to tools, suddenly has to be bought from shops. These shops could be owned by dwarves from the community who purchased ownership of them, or by nobles, who, again, we'll get to later. The stock of these shops gets taken directly from the community stockpile without any compensation for the community members that worked to create them. The economy runs on coins, which the dwarves would often spend comical amounts of time hauling, storing, and stacking. Dwarves would frequently spend so much time reorganizing their money that they would fail to complete necessary work and fall into debt. Fortunately, the dwarves could always buy food, even if their accounts were already negative, but they would be evicted from their rooms if they couldn't pay rent, resulting in homeless dwarves laboring in workshops to pay off a debt that they incurred trying to get food to survive. Nobles were entirely immune from this system and were not required to pay for anything, which means they could acquire any item from any shop for free and then add it to their own personal inventory, preventing it from being used by the community. This resulted in nobles and rich dwarves hoarding giant piles of unused items which they happened to like in their rooms, while the dwarves that produced those items were homeless and in debt. The developer has not ruled out the possibility of reintroducing the dwarven economy at some point when it can be made less broken, but since version 0.34.11, released in June of 2012, the dwarven economy has not been present in the game. Apparently, the issues inherent in privatization and capitalism are somewhat difficult to solve without throwing them out entirely. Some of you might be thinking, Dwarf Fortress might seem anarcho-communist, but it's obviously based more on early colonial America. Well, that's not an unreasonable take at first glance. Dwarf Fortress does bear some similarities to the communalist settlements that appeared frequently during the European colonization of North America. However, describing Dwarf Fortress as just communalist, or even just communist, is inadequate for one big reason. Anarchism. In Peter Kropotkin's Communism and Anarchy, he lists six reasons why communalist or communist settlements, like the ones founded by Europeans in North America, have generally been failures. Thus we have arrived at the following conclusions. Attempts at communism have hitherto failed because 1. They were based on an impetus of religious character instead of considering a community simply as a means of economic consumption and production. 2. They isolated themselves from society. 3. They were imbued with an authoritarian spirit. 4. They were isolated instead of federated. 5. They required of their members so much labor as to leave them no leisure time. And 6. They were modeled on the form of the patriarchal family instead of having for an aim the fullest possible emancipation of the individual. We can see that where real-life communities were identified as failing by Kropotkin, in most instances dwarven society succeeds. While the dwarves may be individually religious with patron deities selected from a randomly generated pantheon, they're not united by a single religious doctrine shared by the entire community. The dwarves aren't isolated, since they allow for immigration and trade with neighbors. The dwarves value time for leisure and artistic expression in balance with the necessary labors of survival. And as far as authoritarianism and patriarchy, dwarven society is largely organized in a flat fashion, very unlike the hierarchy and authoritarianism of the patriarchal family. 
The contrast between the communalist societies and that of Dwarf Fortress also express a change in the cultural view of the idea of utopia. Whereas before the 19th century, utopias are invariably stable and ahistorical, ideals out of time, they now become dynamic and bound to a long prior historical series. In time, we shall have utopia. The early utopia was usually restricted to an island or a similarly isolated environment, and there was a steady counterpoint between the tiny haven of happiness and the greater world outside. By the end of the 18th century, historical utopias can be confined to no narrower limits than that of the whole globe. Pre-revolutionary utopians are physically immobile. Later utopias, on the other hand, are continually building roads, railways, and canals, the great arteries of the unification of mankind. Part 3. The Mayor in the Tomb So let's address the elephant in the room. I've talked about how dwarf fortresses are classless and non-hierarchical, but I've also said we'd talk about nobles eventually. And yes, it's true that nobles are a thing in Dwarf Fortress, but if we examine how these nobles work mechanically and in practice, we can see that their existence doesn't really negate my earlier points for a few reasons. First of all, these nobles don't really function as leaders, and the functions that they do have are basically optional. Unlike real monarchies or other hierarchically organized systems, the nobles in Dwarf Fortress don't hold much actual power. The main thing that they can do is restrict export or mandate production of certain goods, and the player is motivated to accomplish these tasks because not doing so is technically a crime. But this little computer dwarf can't punish you, a real person, for committing a video game crime, so how does that work? Well, we established earlier that the player represents the collective, so punishment for your crimes gets directed at the non-noble dwarves within the community. In the case of an export restriction, for example, the dwarf that moved the restricted item to the trade outpost is the one that gets in trouble for that action, which basically ends up just being some unlucky sucker in the wrong place at the wrong time. In the case of a production mandate that doesn't get met, a dwarf that had the necessary skills to have completed that production is accused of a crime, and if there were no dwarves with the appropriate skills, then a dwarf just gets picked at random. Both of these cases can very easily end up getting productive and essentially innocent members of dwarven society jailed, beaten, or even killed by the guards. And the higher ranked nobles that are accessible later on aren't any more helpful, they just make even more mandates. Also, the mandates and restrictions are based on the personal preferences of the dwarves in these elevated positions. They're the arbitrary desires of an individual being pushed onto the community at large without concern for the community's welfare. You never get a mandate to like, make everyone's rooms better or improve the fortress's food supply. It's always a restriction or a mandate on a random item based on the whim of the noble. It's almost like the powerful don't have our best interests in mind. So based on all that bad stuff, why would you want these guys around if all they do is make annoying demands and get your dwarves roughed up or killed by the police? Well, their only other real function is to provide an outlet for dwarves that are unhappy via the yelled at slash cried on somebody in charge lately thought. Yes, basically the only positive thing that nobles do for your fortress is providing someone for your dwarves to ineffectually yell at when they're feeling unhappy. If that doesn't sound like something worth sacrificing the equity and sustainability of your community for, then you can opt out of having any nobles above the mandatory position of mayor. And while the mayor isn't optional, dwarven justice is. To quote user, oh fuck. To quote user Laurikirumo in a thread titled, so how does dwarven justice work? On the Dwarf Fortress forums. Basically, it doesn't. Eschew all forms of justice. Forever. And the interesting thing is, that's a totally valid way to play. The player is able to weigh the risks of hierarchy and police and decide that they just don't need them. Sure, sometimes some crimes will happen, but at least as far as I've seen, the punishments resulting from failed mandates tend to outweigh any justice you would get from the system. And because there's no statute of limitations on dwarven justice, all crimes ever committed will be punished immediately upon activation of your justice system. Meaning that if you don't opt into the dwarven justice system early on, you're increasingly disincentivized from ever enabling it, because it would trigger a reverse the purge scenario. Now to get back to the mayor. If you do choose to opt out of dwarven justice, there's still a minor consequence to ignoring the mayor's mandates and restrictions. The consequence is that the mayor will be unhappy, as they have no one to carry out their punishments upon their fellow dwarves. Mods? Mods? And if the mayor's orders are ignored for long enough without anyone to carry out punishments, 
and if enough dwarves yell at them to relieve their stress, they'll eventually get so fed up that they throw a tantrum or go into a foul mood, and possibly harm others in the community. Mechanically, Dwarf Fortress tells us that hierarchy is arbitrary, unfair, and unnecessary. Basically, the entire hierarchy and justice system in Dwarf Fortress exists just to carry out the unjust whims of those in positions of power. That's the most mechanically complete anarchist critique of the state and police that I've ever seen in a game. Because of their uselessness, the online Dwarf Fortress community tends to view nobles as… snotty, good-for-nothing parasites. Players have devised numerous unfortunate accidents to either dispose of the nobles directly or at least mitigate their ability to cause trouble. These include such creative methods as keeping them imprisoned in a solid gold cage above a lava pit, or letting them get bit by vampires so they can't die, then walling them up inside a tomb. Because the goal of Dwarf Fortress is essentially well-being for all, the nobles' mandates and justice are counter to both the player and the fortress's goals. We see clearly that when the needs of an individual are placed above the needs of the community, the result is community dysfunction and injustice. And so, as a reaction to the game's mechanical disdain for hierarchy, the players of Dwarf Fortress have come to the very anarchist conclusion that rulers are at best a useless impediment to a community of equals. Therefore, they intentionally reflatten the hierarchy when it attempts to assert itself over the community. Interestingly, while Dwarven Justice and even higher positions like Baron or King are optional, the Mayor is not. A Mayor automatically appears once your population reaches 50 Dwarves. So let's look at this from a wider perspective. The Dwarves in Dwarf Fortress are all migrants from other Dwarven Kingdoms throughout the world. We can assume that the positions of Mayor, as well as all the other hierarchy stuff, are cultural ideas that they've brought with them to this new place even though they practice anarchism by default until the fortress has grown enough. At that moment, when the mayor appears, it can be understood as a kind of reactionary revolution where an old power structure attempts to reintroduce itself into this young anarchist community. As a reaction, as stated earlier, many players choose to intentionally reflatten the hierarchy by making the mayor as ineffectual as possible. What players can do is engineer a situation where a bad actor cannot hurt the community. The community can say, yes, that power is there, but we're not going to let it hurt us. Instead, we're going to maintain a state of permanent revolution against the forces that are trying to reintroduce hierarchy into our society. Players understand that the dwarf noble locked away behind a wall is imprisoned by the community for the sake of the community's well-being. In John Carpenter's 1987 film Prince of Darkness, the physical form of Satan is discovered to be locked away in the basement of a monastery in LA. As a team of researchers tries to understand the evil they've found, it begins to escape, possessing people and mind-controlling others as it tries to summon the anti-god into the world. The survivors, while battling this force of evil, are haunted by a shared dream. This dream is eventually revealed to be a transmission from the future, which was trying to warn them not to allow the anti-god into the world, just as it had been warning the order of monks that previously inhabited the monastery. Like these monks, the dwarves in Dwarf Fortress might not understand why they're entombing this mostly powerless dwarf that just declared themselves mayor, but they complete this task at the behest of a communal will that understands this person is dangerous, and they're trying to bring an even greater evil into our community. Conclusion Tarn Adams, the developer and co-designer of Dwarf Fortress, explained in an interview why he opted for a complex part-based system for character damage in Dwarf Fortress instead of the far more common hit point type system. Hit points are depressing to me. It's sort of a reflex to just have HP slash MP, like a game designer stopped doing their job. You should really question all of the mechanics in the game from the bottom up. I don't know, it really doesn't seem like a conscious decision sometimes. I don't think it's a bad decision many times, but that's assuming it was a decision. I just don't see it as the case. And there are so many equally simple things you could do that are more inventive. This focus on questioning assumed mechanics and designing from the bottom up explains very succinctly why Dwarf Fortress is so mechanically compatible with anarcho-communism. At its core, anarcho-communism is about redesigning the mechanics of society from the bottom up, 
beginning with the individual's needs, and how those can be incorporated into a utopian society that works for all individuals. Let us also observe that if the needs of the individual are our starting point, we cannot fail to reach communism, an organization which enables us to satisfy all needs in the most thorough and economical way. While if we start from our present method of production and aim at gain and surplus value, without taking into account if production corresponds to the satisfaction of needs, we necessarily arrive at capitalism. When we privilege the individual, their surplus and profits, far above the needs of our fellow humans, when we let the mayor out of their tomb, that's when darkness gets a solid foothold in our society. This is the evil that capitalism promotes in our world when it forces us to compete with our would-be comrades for basic survival while wealthy and powerful individuals casually squander life-saving resources according to their whims. Though the individual and individual needs are at the core of anarcho-communism, those needs must always be considered in the context of the capacities and needs of the community that they exist in. In Dwarf Fortress, we can see a rare media depiction of a functioning anarcho-communist society. Some dismiss anarcho-communism as an impossible utopian idea, unmoored from the harsh realities of our world and therefore impractical. Dwarf Fortress demonstrates this argument to be false along practical lines, but such an argument also misunderstands the critical relationship between revolution and utopia. Every utopia is an anticipation of human fulfillment, and many things anticipated in utopias have been shown to be real possibilities. Without this anticipatory inventiveness, countless possibilities would have remained unrealized. Where no anticipating utopia opens up possibilities, we find a stagnant, sterile present. We find a situation in which not only individual, but also cultural realization of human possibilities is inhibited and cannot win through to fulfillment. The present, for persons who have no utopia, is inevitably constricting. And similarly, cultures which have no utopia remain imprisoned in the present and quickly fall back into the past for the present can be fully alive only in the tension between past and future. This is the fruitfulness of utopia, its ability to open up possibilities. This is a transmission from the future. Do not let the mayor out of his tomb. Repeat, do not let him out. As you may have guessed, if you've seen my video about the Sims series, I really like vi video games. I really, I really like video games. 